there are some authors, <coughs> like the people who are sitting with me here, who I'm going to introduce shortly, I suppose I better introduce myself as well, <laughs> who have taken that route. And it's a very, very, very brave route. It's risky, it's blooming expensive. And why they have done that is the important question. So, each of these authors have, I think, many stories to tell. Certainly I know from Barbara and, and from Andre as well that there's lots there. And I suspect that from Fazila also. So on my left, <laughs> always get confused, is Barbara Townsend. Next to her is Andre Swanepoel. He's being an absolute gentleman this morning because he's allowing me to do ladies first. And Fazila Karim. So please give them a warm round of applause. Thank you. And just to, oh, you'll probably want to know who I am. <laughs> so my name is Beryl Eichenberger. I am hugely privileged to be a facilitator at um, the Open Book Festival. I've known Frankie for probably over 20 years when I was in PR and the magic of books has always been something that I've grown up on. And many, 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 many years ago, probably 20 years ago, we did a book festival at the waterfront. In fact, we did three before the Cape Town Book Festival and before any of these other festivals. And Frankie was working at Wordsworth at that particular stage at the waterfront and was the most incredibly helpful person I have ever met. So I am really privileged that we're still all friends. <coughs> And I generally have to take out a mortgage on my house during open book because I want to spend so much money on books. But I do book reviews for Fine Music Radio and for the media. As I said, I was in PR for probably 40 years, which rather ages me, doesn't it? But who cares? And I just love being around books. So how are we going to run this morning? Well, we're going to hear from each of these authors. I'm giving them a platform of 15 minutes so that they can tell their story. And if they stumble, well, I'm sure that I'll be able to jump in with a question. And I want to tell you that the journey is fraught with obstacles. It's not just giving it to a printer, giving your manuscript to a printer. There's the printing, the distribution, the marketing, the promotion, you name it, and all the tags that go along with getting a book out there and into your hands. And just in saying that, all of these books are on sale downstairs afterwards, so I hope that you are going to support these very brave authors. It's not easy, and I really do applaud you all. So, I've given you a warm welcome. I'm going to give a short bio on each of them before they sort of step up to the mic, but step up being uh, metaphorical. You can sit. It's much more comfortable. And I think it's more like a conversation that we're going to have, I hope. And at the end of the session, the uh, end of each of their sessions, they're going to read a little bit from their, from their book because I want you to get a taste of how they write because, of course, that is what's going to attract you to buying the book. And then we can take questions or comments. And just to let you know that all of these sessions are being recorded, so you will be able to go back to them afterwards once they're all up on YouTube, which is really exciting, and you can use them as PR tools, always a good idea. And uh, so I, I thought long and hard about the sort of questions that um, I thought needed answering because I'm, in, as I said, I'm involved sort of in the book industry on, a, on the sidelines to a certain extent and I'm part of an organization called Woman's Own, and we have a woman's library, and that was started by Nancy Richards, and I've had the privilege of working with her for the last 11 years or so. And we get a lot of self-published books, and we are happy to have self-published books. But as we were talking about earlier, there, there tends to be a little bit of, there's a misconception about them, and I think that's, your job is to tell people why they should be buying self-published books. So, I think that 
it's important that you can tell your audience what your stories are about and why it was imperative to have them published. What made you, what compelled you to go out there and take this huge risk? I want to also know, and I'm sure some of the audience will want to know, is whether you did contact mainstream publishers and what was their response, um, or whether you decided to self-publish right from the, mo the beginning. And then I'm sure there were some challenges. So perhaps we can talk about some of those challenges. And I'm thinking of the editing, distribution, and promotion, the amount of time you personally have to spend in, in promoting your book. So that, I think, is enough from me. And I, right. So, out of mind, it's a story of Robin Island, uh, uh, an island we're very, very familiar with, but it's a very fascinating story, and I'm not going to queer Barbara's pitch by saying anything more about it, but let me introduce you to Barbara Townsend, whose lifelong love of reading and writing stories led her to the fields of librarian, a teacher to people from three to 70 years, a textbook writer, and a facilitator of creative writing for children. She has written children's books, farm workers and students from Gabon. Her aim has been to give a voice to people who might otherwise be forgotten, telling the lesser known histories of South Africa. So from that, you have realized that her genre is historical fiction. She's contemplating a third novel and is working on an anthology of poetry. So we have two poets here as well, which is great. Barbara, your first two novels are Ida's Line and Out of Mind, the story of Robin Island, which is obviously the one we're going to talk about today. It's the little known stories, the people who inhabited um, the island, the leper colony, and the people who worked. So Barbara, the floor is yours. Perhaps I might start with asking, what inspired this story? How did it all start? Um, both of them. I'm not talking about either today. Um, both of them started as a segment of family history. I was prevailed upon by my brother's children um, who decided that I really wasn't very busy anymore and I could <laughs> just settle myself down now and write the family history. So I did. So the Ida's line is a piece of that, and the Robin Island is a piece of that. But both books led me to the archives, because when I'd written the family history, I felt when I looked at all the names, and there's a family Bible for the one book, that, that the one book relates to a family Bible, and I used some of those names in my story. In that family Bible, there were all these names of people who weren't alive anymore. And I thought, they need context. They need texture. They need a voice. They need to come alive. And my search for the context took me to the archives. And there, I was overwhelmed by interesting information in the case of both books. And that is what compelled me, because at the archives, my family history faded into insignificance, and a lesser known history of South Africa, in the case of Out of Mind, um, a story of Robben Island, that lesser known history that did not have to do with political prisoners, although I honor what they went through, the leper colony and the people in the insane asylum, some of them there because they had epilepsy, people in the leper colony who were there who did not have leprosy, who had other skin ailments, people banished. And I thought that it was important to give them a voice so that they wouldn't be forgotten and so that that history could be added to the history of Robben Island that we know. So that is 
that is what compelled me, apart from the nephew's nudging at my elbow, have you finished yet? Um, so, so, that, so the two books arose out of that. Um, and I think your next question, Beryl. Well, I was going to ask you how did you research and publish, but I yeah. think I want to ask you to give a little a synopsis of the story because I'm busy reading it and I'm, I didn't stop reading it last night. I nearly had to, like, no, I need to switch the light off because I need to get some sleep. And it's a fascinating story, uh, uh, particularly because you, you talk about those people who were working there, who, but who had very kind souls, who saw beyond what the colonial, colonialists were actually doing and tried to get beyond that. So talk about your, the story, the Reggie and Vera story, if I may. Okay. Um, on the front cover, there's a photograph of my grandmother, who was the theatre sister in the island hospital on Robben Island when it was a leper colony. She met my grandfather on the island. My father was born there. So I have this family connection to the island, and then I went to do the research. And I discovered in the archives that there was a tree planting project between the late 1890s and 1909, which is when my story takes place. So essentially, the story is about Reggie, who is the senior clerk appointed to Robin Island, who goes there to do some of the work associated with this very busy tree planting project. He's going to write the correspondence and help keep records and do other things associated with this. The aim of the tree planting project in the eyes of the colonialists was to create a garden like any in England. On Robin Island. On Robin Island. <laughs> with English trees, flowers, bushes, plants, of, and they ordered them. In the archives, I found a letter my grandfather had written, ordering 5,000 daffodils, 5,000 ranunculus, oak trees, all sorts of things from the island of Guernsey, because I think they thought, oh, island, island, mm. you know. Um, yeah, they'll grow there, but they didn't thrive. And, that. <laughs> <laughs> and failure to thrive is one of the central themes of, of, of this book. <coughs> failure of relationships to thrive, failure of the colonial kind of dream of the English country garden. And yet, despite this blighted, windswept, barren, leached environment, kindness survives. Mm -hmm. And that is the mitigating factor in what <coughs> would otherwise be quite a bleak story. Mm -hmm. um, so that, that, that's it. I'm not finding it bleak at all, actually. I'm finding it colorful. And I'm fascinated by the characters, I mean, some who are really unkind. Well, what did we expect? <laughs> you know, but it, it's a lovely story. But so that's the synopsis of the story. Why did you go the route of self-publishing? We were chatting about okay. this earlier, which I thought was quite funny because I would have the same, probably have to do the same thing okay. if I ever wrote a book. All right. Early on in, I can't even remember because I was so shocked at the result. It was one of the two books. I sent an early draft to a publisher and it was so, the writing wasn't slated, I was. I was told that I was um, forcing history down people's throats and all sorts of other things. And when I recovered from this attack, 
I popped the manuscript away in the drawer and started working on the other one and realized that the clock was ticking. I'm not 25. So I sent a much better draft off to a publisher and to three publishers. And you have to do that because if you wait six months and you're already over 70, I mean, time is marching on now. They take between four and six months to reply. Mm. So I sent it to one, eventually a reply back, we love this, we want to look at it for six weeks. The other one said, we love this, we want an exclusive right. And um, eventually no, none of them could make up their mind. So I withdrew it and I decided the most terrifying thing I've ever done, I said it out loud, I'm going to self-publish this. <gasps> so once I'd uttered that reckless <laughs> statement, it was a matter of pride. You had to do it. I had to do yep. it. <laughs> I know I that. absolutely had to do it. So COVID came and COVID was my huge friend because I realized that everybody was stuck at home and I would start the process off by sending out a chapter a day and there's 60 to people who were captured at home. So every morning at five, I sent off a chapter to 70 friendly readers who responded and sometimes when I needed a break and I fell behind, I got these pitiful emails about I can't get out of bed, I haven't had my chapter, I can't have my coffee without my chapter, can't you hurry up, can't you? Okay, so I got lots of lovely feedback, also some dreadful feedback, which I ignore. Um, As one does. The overwhelming <laughs> feedback was, was very supportive. And each chapter by that stage had already gone through an editor. And then it went out to the 70 people and came back to me with suggestions and whatnot. So then, by the time that process was over, I'd also had five friendly readers of the entire manuscript. Mm -hmm. So it had been under many, many eyes. By that, by that stage, I thought, okay, now I'm going to do it. So off to see the bank. and That's get, the worst part. And get it? some money and kind of explain things to them about this is really going to work. And this kind of steepled hand across the, the other side of the desk regarding me under eyebrows. Anyhow, I decided that it was a matter of honor that I had to break even. So, to do this, are we at this point already? We, uh, yes. Are we've, we here? we've got about three minutes. Okay, all right. And then if we've got the, I mean, mm. do you want to read something from I your could book? I could read something, okay. but I'll but be very brief. So, the, the difficult part um, has been the marketing because um, contrary to what any of you might think, I'm not a public person. I don't uh, like particularly pushing my book, promoting my book or doing anything like that. I've had to gasp and horror go onto social media. I've done 23 launches in the most outlandish places <laughs> on farms, in museums and derelict hotels, beach houses, all over the place. And um, brilliant. sold my books, and I've got 10 stockists, independent bookshops, who, who very kindly stock my book. And I've had the, um, very nice reviews, but there's one thing I want to say about self-publishing, and that is the word self. The only self thing about it is the decision to do it and the, re and the self responsibility of doing it. 
There was no other self about it. Mm -hmm. I was surrounded by friends and family who went out of their way to help me, people who bought my books, people who came to launches. I have a friend here who's been to six launches. Thank and you. <laughs> and that kind of support, so it's not self, it's... Um, it, it's a collaborative thing. And I think the thing that you told me earlier on is that you have broken even. And you know what? That is really something to applaud. <laughs> it really is. <laughs> Barbara, would you like to read a short passage so that people, and then you will, your time will be up. Sure, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. This is um, Reggie, the senior clerk on the island, thinking as he got into his new job and discovered that all was not as he had hoped. And anybody who buys the book will see that Reggie is not what we hoped when we start reading uh -oh. because he is flawed like we all are. What a fool he'd been to think fair play counted for something for, with the men who were in charge of the island. Officially, of course, that was only Dr. Saunders and the commissioner, but Mr. Wade was in charge of the all-important government ferry from the mainland, and Mr. Gov was in charge of the stores that arrived. They were all in it together, behaving like the rulers of kingdoms he had read about as a child. He gave a bitter laugh, and what a kingdom it was, this miserable collection of society's outcasts and junior officials who dared not oppose their authority. Perfect, thank you. Thank you. So, on my far left, Fazila Karim, and her book is called Her Peace at War, by profession, she's a CA, South Africa. I don't know what difference that makes. <laughs> and her daily op occupation is an executive director, FM and HRM, so financial manager and human resources manager. Got it. At a fuel storage facility at the port of Cape Town. Writing's always been her passion since she was a child. And somehow she, as she, as she says, somehow, somehow we always find our way back to our original setting. I think I'm going to let you tell people why you wrote Her Peace at War, because it's an intensely personal book, even though you've written it as a novel, but it's about family dynamics. It involves GBV, but you've written it for um, a younger audience. So, Fazila, take us through Her Peace at War, please. So, thank you. And why? Hello. And why you self-published? <laughs> okay. Um, so, this book was just an emotional journey for me. I started writing it in June last year, just because of personal issues in my own space. Like, on the surface, it looks like everything in your life is going okay, and then all of a sudden, something happens to you. You end up in hospital, nobody can explain what's going on with you, and then, actually, the thing that you need to do is... is delve deeper emotionally and really look at what happened in the last 20, 30 years of your life. Um, this book then ended up being something that I was writing just to try and heal myself, just to try and go back, but in a safe manner. So the way that I did it was to write about it as if everything was happening to someone else. Um, and it was really aimed at teenagers because a lot of the angst and the real traumatic events that had occurred happened during my teens and I was also thinking about um, if I had been a teenager and me reading a book like this that was so representative of the place that I grew up in, of the type of person that I was and all of that, it would have just helped so much in terms of relatability, in terms of looking at the stuff sooner and trying to resolve that with some professional help. Um, but really, it was five months of just an emotional 
uh, like outrage just being poured onto pages. And then in November, December of last year, I realized, okay, this is something. And I, there was no question about it that I needed to get it out there. It didn't even cross my mind to go the normal publishing route, to reach out to any mainstream or anything like that. It was just my own journey and my own way of getting out there. But then I had to put on my professional work at and think about the fact that this is an industry that I have no clue what's going on, so I need to consult with an expert. I reached out to someone that I knew of that had self-published and then um, just got all the details from him what are all the things that I need to consider. So, for example, I didn't know that you needed to get a typesetter that would set up the book um, like so that the pages would flow, so that the font flows and all of that. And I don't care about those things. So aesthetically, I don't care about things. I'm just like the content is there. Like even <laughs> with the fact that this book is there and you need to market it, I'm like, I wrote the book. What more do I need to do? The story is out there. It's, it's up to the universe to just take this thing places, but it apparently doesn't work like that. <laughs> no, sorry, um, lots more work there. No. Long journey. So unfair. <laughs> it's like a rude awakening. So then he told me about the typesetter, about the fact that you needed an editor. I was aware of the editor part, and I was really glad that I had two editors because the first editor was just there for... Um, identifying that this is too much emotion, you, there's just too much coming through, we need to like tone it back. And I was just, I fought back, I was like, no, but it's the real feeling and we must be like authentic about these things. But also I gave in because she was the expert on it. <laughs> and then the second editor really volunteered herself. So I had sent the book to the typesetter and it was like ready to go printing and whatever. So just before he had sent me back the manuscript, his wife was an editor. And she looked at the book and she was really like invested in the story and all of that. So I was taken by that. And then, I, and then he said that she had a couple of things that she wanted to include, which, which was like a glossary because a lot of it was certain Islamic or cultural terms that I use in the book. And I just took it for granted that people outside of this culture would know what it means. And she uh, took the liberty of including a glossary and all of this with, like, with no cost attached. And I was like so overwhelmed with her kindness and with her attention to detail and all of that for wanting to do this for the book. So I was really happy about that. And then it was to go down to print. But um, she kept advising me that I needed to read the manuscript prior to going to print. And I feel like that's the part that I really failed at, which is kind of a recurring theme throughout my life. So when I do things, I tend to do it like really fast, like get this thing done. Like there would be a three hour exam and I'm walking out within an hour because I'm like, this is it. Like I'm giving it my best shot and uh, I'm out of here now. I'm not looking back. Did the same thing with the book. I didn't review or anything like that. So last week was the first time I read it after publishing in February this year. And then I discovered a couple of issues with the typesetting. And then I was like going back to the typesetter now and say, I need to correct these things, but there's like over 200 books out there circulating, and, but the feedback luckily that I've gotten, I think the emotional aspect of the story really pervades like the, well, that's how I'm telling myself that it's working. Um, <laughs> it like pervades the technicalities are sort of, that are sort of erroneous and all of that. But yeah, it's been a, it's been a healing journey. Fazila, give places. us a little bit of a synopsis of the story because um, it's about 14 year old Alia, is that correct pronunciation? Yes, um, Alia. And yes. she's growing up in post-apartheid Cape Town, but she's grappling with the separate, the separations of communities, which we still live with, sadly. So give us a little bit of synopsis, because what, what I really liked was the fact that you've added uh, the lyrics of popular bands and song, uh, uh, popular musicians, at the end of each chapter which sort of in, in some ways lightened it, but in other ways underlined what you were saying. So give us a little bit of a synopsis. So the story is about um, Alia, yes, she's a 14 year old growing up on the Cape Flats actually. Um, and we talk about her grappling with the post apartheid, but it's more like she's, she's there, she identifies these are the separations that they are still living with in the 90s early 2000s, that kind of thing. So the songs that are included in the book, they really do 
go with the emotion of the chapter and that and it helps to explain certain situations that she's experiencing. And a lot of her, the way that she's been raised is she's a huge support for her mother. There's a huge aspect of generational trauma that goes on in the book, which was a shock to me because I was just like on the surface of a generational trauma is an abstract concept. This is not something that I've ever suffered with. And then when I wrote it, I was like, oh, okay, there's an element of this that I was clearly struggling with. Um, so there was that, and there's, there's a friendship that I think I always used to emulate that level of a friendship. So like it's a trio, it's a, like it's the three of you against everything else that's going on in life, and they are really a support to one another. So it's Riza, Alia, and Aisha, and it's just about growing up in high school and having all this stuff going on at home and trying to find your support base. And what Alia ends up doing is like really questioning her destiny and the universe and like even a creator sometimes because of everything that's going on. There's even a line in the book where she talks about is her, um, is her happiness the sacrifice that needs to happen in order to create the balance in the world because that's just how it feels. Mm -hmm. Like everything that's going right for everyone else is something that's going wrong for her. Which is a bit narcissistic now that I think about it. It's like all about <laughs> you. But I think that's what a book does. It's like you, you can either agree with the, with the lead and, and the fact that the person is sort of painting themselves as the, as the hero of their own story or you can go back to it and really criticize those things. So I'm, I think I'm in that space of criticizing quite a bit what Alia has done. So it's a bit of autofiction. So some of it is like obviously true. Well, they and say you write about what you know. Yeah. Yeah. You know, that, that's important. And we all put something of ourselves, I think, into anything that we write. Um, and promoting the book, have you how, how have you launched it? What have you done with it? I thought I did pretty okay, but then I heard Barbara talk about the 23 launches and the outlandish <laughs> and I was like, oh, okay. Because I was more like, then I was comparing it to what I was so doing, I which I think was you've got a lot to talk to each other about. No, absolutely. You know, because this is a learning journey. Mm -hmm. But, but it was very much, uh, I'm, I'm sorry if I'm repeating myself, but I think that having read your book and I'm, ha I'm halfway through your book, or nearly, um, but it, it, there's so much healing that has gone through this writing. Mm. And how healed do you feel having written the book? Um, so has it helped you Yes, heal? It, it has, because since putting it down onto paper, it's no longer the thing that's living inside of me and mm -hmm. that I'm carrying with me into every interaction. It's now separate and I can go back to it. And when I do go back to it now, like last week, uh, I didn't feel that intense emotion. I didn't feel the hurt. I now feel the understanding and the empathy for the people that have maybe been um, sort of really big with the, with the perpetrating of the injustices. I can understand the context a bit better now. I have a clearer view because it's made me a little bit more objective about the things that have happened. So I think definitely in that way it's been a healing, a healing journey. Yeah. You've let it go. Yeah. In, in, in stages. It, it, I mean, yeah, yeah, something yeah. will occur. Nothing, and nothing you happens just in one big go. No. <laughs> yeah. So anything else? Are you going to write something else? Has it spurred you on to write another novel? Yes, definitely. I'm actually busy with a sequel to this book. Great. Yeah. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. And how did you find getting out to, y your target audience was teenagers. Yes. How have you got it out to those teenagers? I've not been very useful in that space. Um, <laughs> so initially... I mean, is it something to go to schools with? Yes, yeah, so I actually mm -hmm. went to um, Westerford High School shortly after I had published, so that mm -hmm. was really... Uh, a fascinating experience for me because I also thought about uh, it's not really going to be very relatable because I was a twenty like I was a teenager about twenty years ago and I don't really relate to the things that are going on right now. But that space really showed me that these struggles are the exact same. They are still exactly. the crutches for yeah. their parents. It's mm. so crazy. Mm. Um, so I think family dynamic is just a universal thing. It is mm. a and, universal um, thing. So that, is, that has been really, but that is the only time that I was in front of it. The rest of it, it's been mothers, like 30, 40 year olds that are really mm -hmm. invested in the story of, of this girl because a lot of it, I think, relates to their own backgrounds and when yeah. they were growing up and that, yeah. I think we'll have to have you at Woman's Own. Would you like to read a piece from your book? Okay, sure. Thank you. Thank you. 
And then Andre, sorry, last but not least, trust me. <laughs> Um, so this is a scene where Alia is, um, she's at a friend's place, but then the friend's mom and aunt is there, and so they're kind of grilling her, which is like a, a rite of passage anytime you go to your family. Um, Assalamu alaikum, Daddy and Auntie Nisreen. That's Alia. Wa alaikum salam, Auntie Nisreen beamed at me, and Daddy nodded her greeting in response. How's your aunt doing, Alia, the one with the factory? We didn't see her at Akbar Bai's iftar function last week. Ah, the interrogations were inevitable, but I was so accustomed to them that I refused to be outwardly triggered and instead turned it into an internal source of entertainment. Oh, KJ, I think she went to Joburg for a business conference or something. I had no way of knowing for sure. The last time I had seen KJ could have been years ago, but I did follow her business page on Instagram and there was a Joburg movement. Allah, in the fast, Daddy did not even bother to disguise her judgment. Auntie Nisreen did not waste the opportunity to tag on her own opinions. Well, that's the life she chose, she clucked. No regard for the sanctity of marriage and the sunnah it represents, and instead, she chases after dunya matters. There was such disdain, such transparent condemnation for the choices KJ made. It made me cringe. And yet, had she been a man, these actions and choices would not just be applauded, but encouraged. Aisha's eldest uncle, Daddy's son, Chicha, was single forever and a business mogul of note. No one said he was running after worldly success and ignoring the sunnah. Was it truly condemned by our religion, or was it a cultural issue for a woman to be business-focused rather than family-orientated? And were, all the, were these all KJ's intentional choices, or did she have to make the most of what fate had dealt her when her parents passed away? For the first time in years, I felt the stirring of empathy for this person that has shut down my mother in her time of need. Thank you. That was lovely. Thank you very much. Thank you. And so we finally come to our final Thanks for brave warrior. I think I'm going to call you all warriors because you really are. Andre Swanepoel, and this is poetry. So we're moving away from the prose. He's a medical doctor with a lot of experience in, in trauma, alternative medicine research and clinical trials. And he's an adventurer who loves to learn and experience new things. You said you have a different hobby every week, something like that. True. Okay. Mm -hmm. So he's always been drawn to writing, poetry in particular, which started as a form of journaling and as a tool to make sense of life and the things we experience. In life, work and poetry, he seeks to capture the essence of what it means to be human and therefore fallible which he believes is preferable to being invincible. There was a quote that was made yesterday, which I thought was, which, which I listened to and then looked up last night. Paul Valere says, a poem is never finished, it's only abandoned. Is that how you feel about poetry? That there's always something you can add yeah. on to it In or parts, push it to the side? I do think that it's, it's, it's something that has a life of its own. As soon as you, you put it down on paper, um, you speak it into the universe, and it's, it's, it kind of starts a cascade of events mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. where you, know, you become aware of something that might, have, might not have been so prevalent up front. You know, it's, it's a feeling that was somewhere deep inside. Now you're acknowledging it. You're putting it down on paper, and it takes, takes on a life of its own. I do, at times, go back to my poetry and then pick up where I stopped and exactly that, then expand and reflect on the growth and sometimes take things in a very different direction from where I thought I was going. Mm -hmm. um, so I do think that it kind of, it learns from you as much as you learn from, from the poem. Mm -hmm. you, your, your feeling is that poetry is relatable and that it seems to find us where every, wherever we are in life. I think particularly um, of the three of you, perhaps this is your way of healing, but also offering the reader a healing mechanism as well from trauma that they may have felt. Please hold up your book. I'm so sorry, I didn't hold it up. And the book is called Lonely Along the Shore. It's not his first book. In fact, you've, you're quite prolific. Um, I think there have been two two minor attempts at, at <laughs> a poetry collection. <laughs> I wouldn't quote them here. Please don't look them up. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm I was much younger. Right. 
but <laughs> perhaps you can elaborate on this collection of a hundred of about a hundred poems that were, have been written Indeed. over the last fifteen years, because you've seen an enormous amount of the human conditions and situations. So, is this what compelled you to write and to go the self-publishing route? How did you get to the self-publishing? Sure. So I think it's such an honor to go last of the three of us um, because I, I feel like I can relate so much to both Barbara and, and Fazila's stories um, of kindness and of, you know, putting yourself out there in the universe and healing through putting yourself out there. And that's that's exactly the, the inspiration for this book. So I used to write privately. So everything I wrote was for me. It's my form of journaling, of mm -hmm dealing, figuring out where I am in the world and how I interact with the world to figure out what I'm feeling. And um, the first time I actually shared poetry was pure accident. I typed some things up for myself, had it on a USB back in the day when USBs were, were still new, all the rage. Um, so I had a USB, borrowed it to a friend to, for her to get some class notes. And you know, the next day she came back with this USB and gave it back to me, burst out in tears, and just said, me too. Me too, I, I feel that too, I'm there too. I've got the same issues. And that's kind of where I realized there's so much power in words and in stories and in mm -hmm. sharing Very your story. So. Where I think we all go through life and you feel like you're in this moment of struggle and you're so isolated, you're alone. There's nobody that feels the same, nobody that can help you. And then actually when you start to share your story, then there are so many people putting up their hands saying, but me too. And that's, that's what I hope that this book will achieve is a cascade of events where I'm the first one to say me too. And then you, you can read and perhaps relate to it and say me too. And thereby you don't feel alone, I don't feel alone. And in our loneliness, we're together. There's so much power in togetherness mm -hmm. and in solidarity. I think we miss it. In our struggles, we, we feel isolated and alone. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, put it, put it out there. So that was the main inspiration behind these poems. The title, Lonely Along the Shore, mm -hmm. it sounds depressing. It is depressing. <laughs> um, <laughs> so just putting it out there. Um, honest. <laughs> trying my best to be very honest. Um, so how I got around to that is I kind of sat down and thought, you know, what, what is it that I want to share in this, you know, starting to, to say me too. And three things came up, and it was lostness, loneliness, and brokenness. Mm -hmm. And those are three, I think, very human conditions that we all go through at some point in time in our lives. And, you know, we, we try to deal with it, we try to hide it, it might be a source of shame. Nobody wants to say, listen, I'm a bit lost or I'm lonely. Especially, you know, men, we're never lost. We know exactly where we're going. Um, not and true. And you don't talk about your emotions. No, oh, my goodness, no. <laughs> we never, we never, we write about them. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so um, those were the three things, the core images that came up. And then I decided, you know, Let's, let's try and put things into these categories and get it out there in the world and hopefully inspire somebody to also say, you know, I'm feeling the same, let's talk about it, let's share, let's heal together. That's more or less how it came about. In terms of the self-publishing, I think what you've kind of grasped is that it's, it's a journey. It's not a quick thing, it's definitely not easy. Um, I would kind of say it's like, Olympic Games, but you are the athlete, and you're competing in every event, and you better be good at that event, because <laughs> <laughs> in the end, the final product, you want to sell your final product, um, which is quite hard. And for me, like with Barbara, I, th I feel like the first, the first hurdle I encountered was thinking, I'm putting this out there in the world. It's me. It's my story. It's my emotions. That's a very vulnerable thing to do, um, so I had to deal with that first, be okay to do that. And then the second thing, to then realize people are gonna read it and they might love it or they will be indifferent, which is sad, or they will absolutely hate it. Um, 
And you must be prepared for all three events because maybe somebody hates it, gives you a terrible review. Yes, you can ignore it, but you have to have a thick skin. So that was my first. Yes, I, th I think that is one of the most important things about, I, I mean, if you look at the number of books that are available to us, it's terrifying. And why would my book sell and somebody else's not? And that putting yourself out there is yeah. the most incredibly brave thing mm. because you're putting yourself out there for criticism and nobody likes criticism. As much as we try and be grown up about it or adult about it and oh yes, well this is constructive and all the rest of it, we don't like it. You know, when somebody says, yeah. I didn't like your book, it's hurtful. Mm. And, you, and, and you have to take it on board and say, well, so but she liked it and he liked it and so what? Nobody's, got, you know, we don't like yeah. the same food. Mm. If you've really got to put it into a very simple context and not take it personally and it's that taking it personally, I think, that is the huge hurdle of getting over when you're an author. Sorry, I No, it's, uh, that's so true. <laughs> it's, such a, it's such a big moment and um, yeah, to take Which that Which is why I will never <laughs> have a book. <laughs> <laughs> no. And focus on your crowd. Focus on the people mm. that really love it, and that's where you should be investing your energy. The the haters will hate. Let them be, be them, and um, they probably have something to learn from it. Um, so that was the first thing. So jumping all of these personal hurdles, and then deciding we're going to do it, which then leads into, at least for me, it was quite a difficult decision. I now have to curate a collection of poems that fit within a certain theme. Um, I don't know, I decided not to specifically write anything for this collection, as I wanted it to really come from real life events, so from something that I lived through, um, otherwise it's just pure fiction. And I don't want anybody relating to fiction, I want you to relate to the reality of what happened to me. Um, so I went to the body of work, can't, last count, don't know, it's maybe 3,000 or 4,000 poems that I have sure. somewhere um, written across, you know, over my lifetime. And then what really helped was for me to have the theme. I knew what the feeling was that I was, that I wanted to convey and then to judge the things that I wrote in the past according to the feeling. And if, it, if you fit the feeling, you make it into the book. And it was more or less 100 things that, so that's actually great if only 100 things are utterly depressing um, <laughs> <laughs> out of 3,000 or 4,000. Um, so then the Maidens into book, I decided on the three sections, so that was lovely. Um, that's a big work. And then it's the long runs. Now you start to look at who's gonna actually publish this thing. Um, I started very judiciously, probably like Barbara, one publisher at a time. We wait for months, weeks or months to hear either nothing back or just a quick little um, copy-paste letter, no thanks. Um, mm. <laughs> um, but what I learned from that journey was firstly, you know, throw, throw your ticket in everywhere. Just, you know, go to everybody, put it out there, it's a big step, but maybe somebody will read. And the second thing I learned was, you know, the publishers are actually quite approachable, some of them at least, where I asked, but why? Why, why is it not a good fit? And there was such a, g a very steep but great learning curve mm -hmm. to then get that feedback, you know, it's too short, it's too long, it's too this, you should be more using more action words in your poetry, or is this even poetry? Blank verse is not poetry. Um, a lot of different things, um, a lot of resistance as well. Basically, poetry doesn't make any money. We're not going to publish it. It's never going to sell. Kind of also trying to understand their perspective. Like, it's perhaps not a great investment if poetry, if poetry doesn't sell. So then I decided I'm going to just, this will be published. So whether somebody's publishing it or I'm publishing it, we'll do it. And fortunately, the last place that I actually inquired it's a company called Europe Books, and they do hybrid publishing. So lovely. Um, so that took me out of the Olympic Games, for which I'm very grateful. <laughs> they provided <laughs> the editor, the proofreader, the cover art. I could sit back and, and relax um, for a time. So it was great. And then you get your book. So then it's lovely. There's a box of books on your doorstep. Now what? A box or 14. A box? <laughs> or 14. <laughs> or 14. Um, <laughs> 
appears on your doorstep, and now, what now? Now the rest of the journey, mm -hmm. it's the PR, the marketing, you know, it's social media, and it's, it's very draining. Um, and then trying to get it into mainstream spaces, which is quite, is particularly difficult, you know, um, especially same reason poetry doesn't sell. So maybe not something that Barbara or Baz experienced, but probably they did. And then exactly that snobbiness, oh, it's self-published. Where if you look at a lot of um, bookstores, <laughs> they've got a disclaimer saying no self-published mm -hmm. books, no hybrid published books. Um, and those that do, um, those that do quickly say like it's it's not it's not a good fit. Or they would say we'll put it on our shelves, but this is our price margin. So you can sell it to us, but you're going to take a massive loss. Yeah. And basically, I sell it to you at 30% of the price um, to just right. have on your shelves, which if you're trying to break even, that's... Um, Very, difficult. <laughs> Very difficult. It's not a thing. So I've, I've mainly been taking point, doing the things myself. Um, I'm last in this competition. I've had one book launch, and I'm seeing this as my second one, so I'm two in. <laughs> Still have a, a ways to go to get to the 60-odd um, that Barbara has and all of Fan's events. I'm a great believer that um, people take notice of things that are in unusual places, so that you take your poetry book to a nursery, a flower nursery, a plant nursery, <laughs> And you suggest that you do a reading there too, because they always have yeah. gardeners and everything and garden get togethers and everything. But it's sort of out of place, mm -hmm. and that's what makes you noticed a thought for you. No, so definitely. It, I'm you here. don't go to the usual suspects, so to speak. Yeah. Andre, would you, sorry, w would you like to read one of your poems? For sure. Um, I, would, I would read three quick ones, one from each section, if you'll indulge me. Um, so the first one is from the section about being lost. And um, it's quite short, but me, I'm always getting somewhere and thinking, what's the next thing? Where am I going next? So this one I wrote 100% for myself. It's a lesson I'm still learning every day. If we're all searching, perhaps there's some value in standing still. And that's the entire poem. Mm, yes. I'm learning that lesson every single day still. Um, so, for the lonely ones out there, the house represents the home and stands witness to all within its walls. So, these houses are caught between the build and the break, lingering on the verge of collapse, and the world is a snow globe dream, and its contents suspended in sleep. And then this one is quite simple. My loneliness is profound. I am profoundly lonely. Profound, I am lonely. I am profoundly lonely. My loneliness is profound. And then one last section um, for some, some brokenness, just to finish off. So this one, quite interesting. So it's a bit of, of my trade, but also not a lot. So love, I'm shut off from feeling, like an animation stripped of its core. My body gives way to the bypass that hums a mechanical tune that's familiar to me. It's the sound of some much-needed maintenance. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. We're nearly out of time. I can't believe that this... Yeah. Thank you. You have all been absolutely amazing. I, I don't know if there are any questions from the audience, but please, we'd love to have them before you go pounding off to your next session, but you do have a break in between. So are there any questions? If I can see. I just wanted to say, yeah, I, I really think you're all so brave and, mm. and well done. Obviously the journeys haven't been that easy and yet you stuck at it. I also write a lot of poetry, and I also want to write some books. And um, unlike all of you, I haven't kind of yet, um, although I've written many poems, I haven't, haven't got the book into writing yet. And I probably would have to go that self-published route because I'm 
quite individualistic and I would get hutful of, with a lot of rejection, <laughs> so I, I could see myself going that route. But I think you, you're just a reminder of how it's okay to get into that space and be yourself, and I really salute you um, for actually putting emotions and all of that out there. I, I think it's wonderful, and I think it's very comforting and healing for those of us um, like myself who are going through a lot of trauma. Thank you. Thank you. I think Liz Anne would like to say something. Hi. Um, yeah, uh, obviously you're doing something more than having 14 books in a box in your hallway because somebody invited you onto the stage, so well done on whatever it is you think you might not have done. Um, I want to just ask you, do you find as though your previous friends are looking kind of shifty-eyed and dodging you and avoiding the topic of your book? Has it changed any dynamics in your um, social lives as far as you've noticed? Interesting. Fazila? Yeah, definitely. Um, I've not seen 40 of my cousins since I've published. <laughs> they've, um, <laughs> they've not read it, but they've made assumptions that I'm um, basically exposing the family. Um, and uh, from friends, I've just really understood who my inner circle is, and I'm just really, I feel really grateful and blessed with, with mm -hmm. who that is and, and the, the support, the proper objective support from people. But definitely the alienation and the rejection, which is like also a lot of implied rejection, what you were saying earlier about um, the feedback, the negative feedback mm -hmm. and all of that. Part of it is even the reception of the mm -hmm. book and implied rejection and you having to sift through and be reflective about that feeling of rejection and what is it really and what is it about it that affects you so much and distance yourself maybe from it so that it's something healthy that you can have a relationship with and not something that is going to drain you daily. Mm -hmm. so that's just been my experience of it. Andre, have you had that experience? Sure, fortunately nobody that's dodging me. <laughs> <laughs> But um, but for sure, I do get a lot of people that, you know, send me a picture and just tell me, this is my favorite one, or did you is this about me, or did you write this for me? And I was like, yes, of course I did. It's, <laughs> it's all you. <laughs> um, so buy the book for Christmas, give it to your people, it'll make me really happy. Um, but no, a lot more engagement and more of what I've hoped that this would be, an opportunity for people to say, you know, I feel the same, and thank you for making me feel seen. Um, mm. And I think that's something we all look for in life, is to be seen yes. wherever it is that we are. Mm. Um, so it's been a very positive thing for me. I would love to get rid of some of my cousins, but unfortunately, <laughs> in the next <laughs> um, I I have felt uh, totally nurtured by all my friends, family, acquaintances, mm -hmm. um, with the numbers of books they bought, heaven knows what they did with them. <laughs> but, um, yeah, um, and just general kindness um, and contacts, lots of contacts. And if I, today, can inspire anybody here to publish their own book, it would make me very, very happy. Um, it's a hard journey, but there is nothing, maybe having a baby, but there is nothing quite like holding a book with your name mm. on the cover, the cover you chose, not some bossy person told you to have. Um, there's nothing to beat that feeling. And, um, okay, then the hard yards start, because you've got 400 of them standing in your study and they've got to get out the door. So, but it's a wonderful feeling. And you, I think you cement relationships through publishing a book on your own. But you aren't on your own. You're with all this yeah. incredible support group around you. It's It's... It's not a lonely journey. No. Mm -mm. And as you quite rightly say, it's about making connections. And you learn who your friends are mm. as well. I think that's the important mm. thing. Ladies and gent... Oh, gosh. <laughs> They're the friends. <laughs> Those are the friends. Oh, okay. Thank you, friends. <laughs> but 
But you do, mate. It, it, I, I, I have thoroughly enjoyed this session. Thank you so very much. It's been illuminating for me, who's never going to write a book, but <laughs> I'm out there in the public space in, in, a, in a way. But thank you, all of you. I, I wanted to make one remark about your covers because I thought that the cover design, and I sort of, I love design, and I thought that your covers were very relevant and they told me what your book was about. Mm -hmm. So whoever did your designs, well done. They, they really are excellent. So now, will you please go downstairs? The ladies and gentlemen will be down there to sign books, but the books are for sale below. There's a table with them all. And uh, please make them take less than five books home. <laughs> Thank you very much and enjoy the rest of Open Book. It's been an absolute privilege to speak to my authors this morning and to an audience on this miserable day. And thank you so much to the organizers of Open Book. It is definitely a happy place for so many of us yeah. and so, so very well curated. So thank you. Have a great day further. <laughs> <laughs>